moving on uh, we now describe the third and probably the most asked and most quoted aspect of gfr how is it regulated now before I, we jump into the uh, to the nitty gritty uh, let me uh, comment on why is it so important look gfr is what will make the filtrate right and the filtrate will go on to make the urine okay so where does the filtrate come from well the filtrate comes from the blood and in the blood it comes out of the plasma okay where does this blood come from it comes from the feeding arteries of the kidneys architecture where does that come from it comes from the renal artery the main artery where does the renal artery come from it comes from the descending aorta and now you know where this story is going okay so fluctuations in arterial blood pressure again fluctuation in arterial blood pressure can affect and does affect uh, an organs blood flow or perfusion right we have all sorts of local blood flow controls at the level of tissues again you started in, studied it in circulation under local blood flow control so in you must have read there that kidney renal blood flow is is exquisitely auto regulated the word auto regulation must have gone through or must have come through in your studies so you cannot have a situation where our fluctuating arterial blood pressure which by the way doesn't fluctuate much anyway but it does fluctuate uh, between this when you're awake when you're asleep your posture uh, when you exercise it does fluctuate during uh, uh, your daily routine activities not too much though however it does fluctuate so fluctuating arterial blood pressure if you have no system of keeping gfr constant in the face of a fluctuating uh, arterial blood pressure i.e the feeding pressure keeps on fluctuating and if you don't have a safety net inside the kidney what will happen what will happen is as soon as the blood pressure increases you will have increased gfr right and if you have increased gfr now if you put in that statistic that i mentioned uh, the daily statistic that if you uh, do not reabsorb 19% uh, of the 20 units of uh, uh, the 20% filtration fraction if you don't reabsorb 99% of it i.e most of it then what will happen is your urine volume will increase so I usually give this very interesting funny example of you exercising so imagine you going for a run what will happen you go for a run and you push it i.e you run fast very fast the, the blood pressure starts going up the renal perfusion starts going up yes and if the gfr is not auto regulated it doesn't behave uh, in the face of this uh, fluctuating naughty blood pressure what will happen is the filtration amount the amount of filtrate that is formed will increase the tubular uh, network has only so much capacity okay it has a finite capacity so it will try to reabsorb most of it but the pressure will be so much the amount of filtrate that you're forming is just so much that it won't be able to cope resulting in increased urine formation so as soon as you start to really push it in exercise you will end up you know where okay uh, sober comments are invited on this point Tell me where will you end up uh, if this is the case? Okay. Okay. So, point is GFR needs to be regulated, and it does. That's the good news. So this again is a is an SEQ uh, roadmap for you. If somebody asks you how is GFR regulated, uh, the convention, however, is that you are asked specifically about auto regulation ie or myogenic mechanism or tga okay so uh, from uh, the seq perspective 
you would be asked specifics because uh, they have to uh, condense uh, the question focused on five marks that's their limitation so they they cannot ask you really the whole the whole uh, shebang they need to ask they need to ask you something which they can justify for five marks or less okay so from an SAQ point of view you need to understand that you'll be looking at this part of this roadmap auto regulation you need to know very very clearly uh, however in a viva you you can be asked a broader question obviously it's verbal you can be asked that okay tell us uh, how the gfr is regulated then you say that okay there are two main uh, uh, components to it an intrinsic component and there is an extrinsic component okay an intrinsic in the intrinsic component you have auto regulation and in auto regulation you have myogenic and da 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 while in extrinsic mechanism you have nerves basically sympathetics and you have various hormones uh, uh, running around which also may affect uh, the gfr but remember if you're asked which is the most important mechanism of gfr regulation it's this intrinsic auto regulation okay now look at this this is probably one of the broadest ranges you have studied in physiology up till now 80 to 180 mmhg so what does it say that if you remember i was just talking about fluctuating the arterial blood pressure this is the range it's very impressive if you were to fluctuate arterial blood pressure and we are talking about mean arterial blood pressure i hope you still remember some of your circulation you haven't forgotten everything that mean arterial pressure is the value is around is basically 95 to 100 let's say 100 okay if you drop it to 80 or if you increase it to 180 gfr will still be hovering around 125 ml per minute that's the beauty of auto regulation so you can now appreciate such a wild swing in arterial blood flow does not really impress the gfr it stays relatively constant how is that feat even possible through these two mechanisms in the graphical form look at this the mean arterial pressure is constantly increasing from 40 to 80 then from 80 to 180 and then 180 and onwards so as i said between 80 and 180 you will have auto regulation so from 40 to 80 the gfr did increase but this is per day it's in liters per day so if you have a mean arterial pressure going up to 80 mmhg you will have increase in gfr from 40. now from 80 to 180 you will have a constant gfr this is this is auto regulation this is auto regulation but of course with everything there is a there are limits and beyond 180 if you still increase the arterial blood pressure then gfr will start to go up and all sorts of issues will come into play and if you decrease blood pressure below 80 all sorts of problems on the everything decreasing side will come into play so gfr will decrease urine output would decrease uh, uh, fluid will be retained inside the uh, body uh, the other functions of the kidney osmoregulation and ph balance all sorts of problems will start to happen okay this is it this happens when the renal is when the kidney shut starts shutting down okay so this is that okay as we discussed the first mechanism of gfr regulation is the myogenic mechanism as the word indicates myogenic myo means muscle the smooth muscle of vessels genic means response uh, to something all right so it's the response of the smooth muscles of the arterioles uh, of the vessels inside the kidney uh, such that in a way that gfr remains constant now what does that mean practically if i give it to you in one line practically what it means is if you fluctuate if you increase or decrease uh, pressure inside the renal artery okay blood pressure inside the renal artery if you change it what will happen at the afferent arteriole is that if you increase uh, the blood pressure inside the renal artery then the afferent arteriolar diameter it uh, decreases so in other ways it vasoconstricts 
okay uh, to understand this uh, you need to uh, understand the following if you increase renal arterial pressure there will be more blood which then uh, starts to uh, come to the afferent arteriole if more blood is to come to the afferent arteriole afferent arteriole needs to do something about this because if it lets this increased blood at an increased pressure uh, go through go through it to the glomerular membrane glomerular membrane will obviously make gfr out of it so if there is more uh, blood pressure more blood coming through then the, the gfr will increase this is not right this is inconvenient because well uh, daily routine during daily routine in your day the blood pressure does fluctuate okay a bit here and there sometimes it increases sometimes it decreases uh, when you start running when you start exercise it increases okay now you don't want your gfr to increase every time you exercise right this will be very inconvenient because if the gfr increases there will be more urine formation right so you understand what i'm saying here uh, you don't want to go to the washroom every time you exercise that's that's <laughs> ridiculous right so um, these changes in the routine changes in the renal artery in the renal artery pressure is resisted remember this word is resisted by the afferent arteriole uh, and it constricts it vasoconstricts when the renal artery blood pressure goes up and hence it absorbs that extra blood pressure and uh, does not let the glomerulus suffer uh, because of this increased arterial blood pressure in as a result what happens is the renal blood flow going through the glomerulus remains constant and hence the gfr remains constant okay of course there is a range of it range for this so between 80 to 180 mean arterial blood pressure this is we talking about mean arterial blood pressure here okay so it it's normally is it's around 100 but if you decrease it to 80 or you increase it to 180 uh, gfr will remain constant because arterial uh, afferent arteriole will vasoconstrict or dilate accordingly to absorb the uh, the changes in the blood pressure in the renal vasculature so that you get constant gfr however below 80 or above it above 180 uh, uh, this myogenic automatic mechanism uh, does not uh, does not occur okay so that's myogenic mechanism of auto regulation um, keeping the gfr uh, constant the second these things are uh, more simple you have already looked at this architecture i i paste it here because a i just love this diagram it's beautiful it shows you the internal structure uh, of the glomerulus and and the podocytes and all this sort of thing uh, and then it shows you the afferent arteriole uh, and efferent arteriole and this is where the dct loops back and comes close and then loops back away from it and forms the collecting duct i remember i've mentioned this already in the functional anatomy class and look at this uh, the cells that are facing the afferent and the efferent arteriole they are the uh, macula densa and then the cells of the visceral uh, smooth muscle of the afferent arteriole and the efferent but more on the afferent side they specialize to become the jg cells okay this is important this whole thing here macula densa plus jg cells of the afferent and yes the efferent they form the juxta glomerular apparatus the okay, juxta glomerular apparatus and i probably have mentioned that <clears throat> the macula densa is looking inwards so they sense sodium chloride concentration inside the the filtrate that is arriving in the distal convoluted tubule and they are sensitive to the sodium chloride concentration especially the sodium concentration and if there is any fluctuation in it they they sense it they give the signal to the jg cells and appropriate responses uh, 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 take place in the jg cells okay now what are, what are those responses this is uh, this we discussed today okay <clears throat> Okay, so we were discussing uh, TG balance, tubular glomerular feedback mechanism. Uh, this is a continuation of this diagram and my discussion on JG apparatus. Okay, 
So look at this diagram. And remember, this is an independent UQ. Uh, if they don't give anything from this section, they may certainly give you tubular kilometer balance. Basically, this graph, uh, this uh, flow chart. So look at the scenario. So the arterial blood pressure, they say, uh, say it uh, decreases. Okay. Um, this will result in glomerular hydrostatic pressure to drop. If the glomerular hydrostatic pressure to drop, this is, we are assuming no autoregulation uh, is taking place. All right. So if, in case of no autoregulation, there's a free fall. Or you drop the arterial pressure, all sorts of problems come uh, to the hydrostatic pressure. It drops as well. And since this is the main determinant of the GFR, the GFR goes down. And now what happens? <clears throat> when the GFR goes down, uh, the amount of filtrate that is formed decreases. Okay. Just focus on what I'm saying. Decreasing GFR will decrease the amount of filtrate formation. Yes. Yes. And when this decreased filtrate will go through the proximal convoluted tubule where there is the most amount of sodium chloride reabsorption taking place normally, its velocity will drop. When you have more fluid formation, the velocity goes up, right? If you have less filtrate formation, the velocity goes down, right? Now, in this case, since the filtration is not happening uh, properly to its maximum uh, uh, extent, what will happen to the velocity? The velocity will go down. The, in a, uh, said in another way, the filtrate passes more time through the proximal convoluted tubule because the velocity is less, it will have more time to sort of waddle through the uh, proximal convoluted tubule. So the machinery which is picking up sodium chloride will say, hey, this wagon has slowed down. Let's take more sodium chloride out of it. So sodium chloride gets more reabsorbed than usual. So when it eventually arrives at the macula densa, while it, it used to be normal in its sodium chloride concentration, when everything was fine, in this case, in the decreased GFR scenario, because of the velocity, et cetera, that I just mentioned, the sodium chloride pickup at the PCT proximal quantity tubule is increased, leading to a less sodium chloride arriving at the macula densa. Okay. Now, I've, I've mentioned in the earlier slide and earlier in functional anatomy as well, that macula densa basically senses sodium chloride concentration, mainly the sodium concentration. Okay. <clears throat> this is the signal that macula densa then gives the JG cells. If I just uh, take you back to the diagram, this. So this is the tubular fluid that has arrived, which is deficient in sodium chloride. Macula densa picks this up. And when macula densa picks it up, uh, it gives the signal to its very nearby cousins, the JG cells. So the signal goes to the JG cells that, look, sodium chloride is less. Okay, there must be something wrong with GFR. JG cells of the afferent and some of the efferent, mainly the afferent, they start secreting renin. Now, renin is already pre-made in these within these cells and it is released at a constant rate inside the afferent arterio. So renin is, is made here, is already formed here, and whatever is formed, it's released into the blood coming in the afferent arteriole, and then it hits the systemic circulation, right? In this case, when you have decreased GFR, decreased NSCL at macula densa, the rate of renin secretion increases. Remember, it is not zero normally either. It's there. Some of it gets released. Okay. Uh, the rate of secretion of renin increases in this scenario. Now, what does renin do? Renin is basically an enzyme. And it's, uh, you again have studied this in circulation. I keep on referring you to circulation. You have studied this. You've read about this. And what does it do? 
in circulation in blood pressure regulation long term blood pressure regulation you have read, you read this renin is the enzyme which converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1 okay you need renin for that now angiotensin 2 1 converts into angiotensin 2 in the lungs under the influence of an enzyme over there the enzyme over there is angioconverting angiotensin converting enzyme ace a c e ace is the enzyme which converts angiotensin 1 formed by renin in, into the operational uh, compound or hormone angiotensin 2 it's this angiotensin 2 as the name indicates angiotensin angio means vessel tensin means tension so angiotensin 2 is one of the most powerful vasoconstrictors naturally made by the body so as soon as you start to increase angiotensin 2 level in blood what happens is all sorts of vasoconstrictions take place angiotensin 2 before i move on angiotensin 2 is a vasoconstrictor for all of the body so remember that it has been released in this scenario a decrease in arterial blood pressure so immediately you can you can appreciate that if you now are making an indigenous compound on its own on the body is making it within it which will vasoconstrict artery arteries it will improve arterial blood pressure okay so angiotensin 2 in arterial blood pressure uh, you studied it under uh, intermediate uh, mechanisms angiotensin 2 basically improves arterial blood pressure because it's a vaso it's a general vasoconstrictor now since we are discussing uh, renal its role in renal physiology <clears throat> we will just focus on what it does in within the renal uh, the kidney in this scenario so angiotensin 2 basically constricts the efferent arteriole and causes the biphasic effect which i have just mentioned earlier at low concentrations and then at high concentrations please connect it with that concept over there and <clears throat> basically at milder concentration it basically does this and raises it raises the glomerular hydrostatic pressure raises a gfr and everybody is happy okay at uh, by the way at 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 high concentrations it it also vasoconstricts the afferent and then eventually brings the whole system uh, down back to normal which is not evident in guyton's flowchart okay <clears throat> something that you need to note it's a regulatory mechanism but it also needs regulation so too much of this will in itself be a problem you need to then vasoconstrict the afferent to bring the whole system back down to normal He's, he has mentioned something uh, here which is a decreased macular denser nscl has a vasodilatory effect at the afferent i have not found this and uh, i mentioned it to my students i this is, is not mentioned in uh, any standard textbook that uh, i have gone through but guyton mentions it and so you need to you need to make a note of it that macular densa decreased sodium chloride <clears throat> has two wings one is this famous well documented uh, phenomena which eventually vasoconstricts the efferent but it seems to also according to guyton it seems to also have a direct effect on vasodilation of the uh, arteriole uh, afferent arteriole which obviously obviously has a beneficial effect in increasing the hydrostatic pressure uh, uh, concluding remarks about autoregulation it's absent below 80 90 80 to 90 mmhg it's not perfect uh, <clears throat> things do change a bit with changing blood pressure uh, this is the end of intrinsic uh, with extrinsic uh, I'll just skim through this sympathetic stimulation. I've already spoken about there are naturally occurring or in, uh, exogenous vasodilators uh, These are vasodilators and vasoconstrictors it should say Both are vasodilators. I beg your pardon. So <clears throat> I don't know why there are two headings here. So there are vasodilators which improve or increase uh, the uh, What you call uh, the blood flow? There are sympathetic simulation which 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 would constrict the blood flow. Uh, an interesting uh, observation is again this: people who are who are who are on high protein diet, they they tend to get uh, more uh, GFR 
same is the case with the uh, early onset uh, diabetes mellitus. Uh, 